And then there are metrics that are uh, broader, that are the outcome measures based off the HEAS quality measures generally that apply to everyone in the PPS. So, for example, increasing rates of follow-up after mental health hospitalization, increasing, increasing adherence to uh, antidepressants. Uh, the, the roadmap uh, incorporates um, IT elements from both of those type of metrics. So the next step uh, for this is we're going to take this draft version to our various behavioral health committees um, for review uh, and feedback and, and changes as, uh, as necessary. Anything else? No, just to um, reiterate, this process will be essential for us to really, as we link our EHRs with Spectromedics for more real-time data analytics from either uneducated claims or perhaps some structure element from EHR, we would like our practices and our partners to um, really to take a look at the roadmap and you know, to incorporate as many of the elements as possible um, at the earlier so that when we have Spectromedics laying on top of many EHR, we would then be able to get more real-time data for, for meaningful analytics. Yeah, these elements are, are it's extremely useful for us to know where we are and how we're doing performance-wise, uh, which is information that will be very useful for all of us. Okay, and before we get into our metrics, um, I just want to remind everyone this is a, a, this PowerPoint is draft. After the session, we'll be sending out a recording, we'll be sending out an updated PowerPoint, and we'll also be sending out a full list of all the contract-related metrics uh, for your review. So um, we're going to move on to the next slide, uh, diabetes monitoring for people with diabetes and schizophrenia. And I'm going to have Dr. Manjanoff, um and Dr. Smith go through this because there are two components to this. Sure. Thank you, Susan. Um, the next set of metrics, I believe there are five or six slides related to diabetes monitoring as well as screening for diabetes. Uh, there are two separate paper performance measures, and both are related to HEDIS measures. Uh, that we have incentives built into um, our paper performance pool of funds. Uh, from a co perspective, we, from a funding perspective, we decided to lump them together because with the assumption that all our practices, primary care practices that are providing care for adults will likely have at least one patient with schizophrenia, we know it's probably more. And the second assumption that we've made is that all of, you know, um, all of them would have patients on antipsychotic. If for whatever reason your practice doesn't have a patient with schizophrenia or antipsychotic, please see us and we'll see how, big, how best to modify the bundle for you. But we went with the assumption that, uh, that all practices across our PPS would have at least patients with schizophrenia and an antipsychotic. So from a monitoring perspective, we're looking at uh, individuals who have schizophrenia, um, we want to be able to, um, and, and diabetes, we then want to make sure that they're getting periodic hemoglobin A1C as well as LDLC screening. So this is a HEDIS measure um, for ages 18 to 64. We'll be looking for, um, the next slide looks at what we specifically look for this monitoring activity. So what we want is pretty much what HEDIS is asking for, uh, but from your system, is number of people with 18 to 6 with schizophrenia and diabetes, and who had the screening done during the measurement year. Here we're not looking for claims data. We really, because you know, claims data for this would come from payer, but what we're looking for is a structured element from your EHR to show that you had the screening done or you have the results on your EHR. Um, uh, so we want to really you know, monitor more in real time as to how, what, you know, how many patients are getting screened, uh, with people with schizophrenia and diabetes. Uh, next slide looks at now screening. The headings are accurate. Now we're looking for screening for people who are antipsychotic medication. Now we want to screen them for diabetes, either if they have uh, schizophrenia, bipolar, but an antipsychotic medication. We're looking for a simple you know, glucose screening or any screening for diabetes would be applicable for. The next slide looks at specifically what we're looking for from the numerator um, as well as denominator. So there are two separate but related uh, measures. Uh, we've decided to lump them into one bundle. If anytime, any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. I uh, will be happy to provide more explanation. The next slide looks at, you know, we're now taking this to um, to one level um, 
to some extent higher. We want to be look at practices not only reporting on their current performance, but also looking to see if they have process to do some outreach. You know, in other words, if a patient has uh, diabetes and schizophrenia, if they've not had hemoglobin A1C done, um, the in your system, you don't have a report, we want you to do some outreach to them, identify those patients, you know, create gap list, and bring them into care. So if you were to do that, we certainly are incentive, will incentivize as part of this bundle. So here we're looking for next slide, looks at specifically in the numerator and denominator. Yes. Next slide, Chris. Here we're looking for, you know, people, agencies with schizophrenia diabetes, we're looking for two sets of information. How many of them have had, you know, LDLC and hemoglobin A1C during the measurement year? Um, and then you know, this is a quarterly report, so we will be looking for really, you know, patients who were seen in, the, in that quarter, and then how many were contacted to come in for care. So we'll, we'll review these, um, the dates because we want to make sure that we're aligning the reporting dates to what we're asking for in the numerator denominator. We may make some changes to the dates, but the, um, the intent behind it is that we, we get some real-time data on the number of patients who have either been screened or who have been contacted for, for screening. We, because these are so, and this point, especially if you look at the bundle number, it's a high performance eligible. In other words, we have significant dollars at stake uh, for this one measure. We want to try and um, you know, implement system to be proactive to reach to our target. Next slide. Uh, similarly, on the screening as well, we want to uh, build some additional dollars for proactive population health management approach for identifying patients who are due for. Uh, diabetes screening, if they are antipsychotic. Next slide, please. Again, we'll be looking for, um, because this is not high performance, we're not looking for a quarter report and just one report to show that you have a process in place to identify and you've taken some, uh, some action to reach out to those patients to get the screening done. Any questions, clarifications, certainly if you, you know, please uh, enter into your chat box or email us. We'll be happy to provide more information. Okay, moving on, we're, uh, the next metric relates to screening for clinical depression and follow-up. Again, um, this is a standalone, and it's the percent of patients screened for clinical depression using a standardized screening tool approved by Benny, and um, more importantly, the percent of patients with a positive depression screening that receive follow-up care within 30 days. Um, if we move to the next slide. Again, we, uh, Brendan, Dr. Smith, would you like to explain anything more? Um, but is this the PHQ-2 and 9? Uh, yes, PHQ-2 and 9. Um, so the state has a list of a few standardized depression screening tools that they accept that count for the ultimate HEDIS measure, the PHQ-2, PHQ-9, the Beck Depression Inventory. There's a variety of others. Um, most folks are using the PHQ-2 or the PHQ-9 within our PPS to keep it standard, uh, and for those doing the impact model, uh, that's required. Much? So just to clarify, the reason why this is standalone, as you go through the slides, you will see additional metrics uh, for screening for clinical depression. This one specifically is related to our pay for performance outcome measure. Currently, as a PPS, we're doing pretty uh, poorly. I think based on the most recent chart audit, we have shared, in, I think, 7% of the records had evidence of both screening as well as if they were positive, that there was a follow-up in place. And our target is to get to 80%. So as you go through this, you will see we are, we are putting in some additional incentive for practices to, again, take a population health approach to identify and to put in policies for, for screening every adult coming to the practice uh, at every visit. I think that's what some of our best performing practice have done every patient, every visit model. Using that approach, we certainly expect our numbers to be higher, as well as making sure that there is a follow-up. And the follow-up gives us some flexibility with what we mean by follow-up. It could be in a referral, it could be treatment, it could be counseling, all of them would be considered follow-up. Um, again, the most recent chart audit data we received a couple months ago uh, for, for patients seen through June of 2016, I believe, uh, our performance was quite poor. Okay, the next one is another uh, part of a bundle. It's initiation and engagement of alcohol and other drug dependence treatment. So um, it speaks to adopting evidence-based screening initiatives for alcohol and drug dependence 
and um, I'll have Dr. Smith speak to this. And then um, for supporting documentation, provide a number of patients receiving screening for alcohol or drug dependence and the number of referrals made for positive screening. So again, you're doing the screening and you'll be able to track those who have, are referred for treatment. And if you go to the next slide. Um, Dr. Smith, do you have anything to add about the tool we're using or? Yeah, so the state is focused on the effort model of screening, brief intervention, brief intervention and referral to treatment. Um, SAMHSA uh, lists, uh, I forget the exact number, five or six, um, uh, validated standardized screening tools that they support using um, the audit, for example. Um, we tend to have ones that we prefer, so we can certainly provide guidance uh, and information uh, for those of you who are doing this uh, for the first time um, and can also help identify the, um, the approved measures. Okay. And the next slide, I'm going to turn over to Dr. Manjana. Uh, this was as part of the paper performance again, we um, need to have uh, adherence to treatment. In other words, patients are seen within 14 days as well as they keep uh, ongoing relation with the substance abuse uh, program. So to incentivize that, we are asking for, uh, for, for practices. This is a primary care-based measure. So we're asking for practices in addition to screening we would like them to establish a referral to, including a warm transfer that's applicable, or it's available, really referral to a substantive program uh, for patients who are screened positive. I'm sure it's happening. I'm sure you're all doing it. But we want to, again, incentivize your current practice and making sure it's happening consistently. And the next slide really specifically looks at what we're looking for from both from a uh, here, we need to make some minor modification numerator. We'll correct this. Essentially, what we're looking for is number of patients who are screened who turn positive. And how many patients were positive of the ones used of your total population. And then how many of them really received referral or warm transfer to a subunit program within 14 days. If I could jump in and define warm transfer for those of you who, um, who don't know. Um, the way that it's conceptualized is if your primary care site or site with substance abuse treatment on site, uh, physically connecting uh, the patient to the treatment provider uh, at the time of the positive screening or diagnosis counts. Um, if the provider is not on site at that moment, say is only he or she is only there a couple times a week, connecting them, that patient, to the um, care coordinator, care manager, uh, staff, uh, in person, who can then, who will then connect that person with the provider? Okay. And the next one is uh, a metric related to follow-up care for children prescribed ADHD medications. Again, this is part of a bundle, and there are two components to this. So, to develop a process for outreach to patients of children that were that newly prescribed ADHD medications that did not complete. Um, so we're looking at for a follow-up visit within 30 days after starting the medication and also at least two follow-up visits within nine months after the initiation phase ended. So if you go to the next slide, again, how do we capture this as a report? The cohort of, of patients would be the number of children ages 6 to 12 years who were newly prescribed medications between January and December of 2017 and then be able to look for the number of children who had one follow-up visit within 30 days after the initiation of the medication, and then again, the number of children who, in addition to the, the first visit, had at least two additional follow-up visits within the nine-month period. The next one is um, related to follow-up care, and this is more process-related. Um, and this is really the number of uh, post-visit calls to parents of children with new medication prescribed one to two weeks after the new prescription. So again, this is to make sure that the parents have, in fact, filled the prescription and, uh, and they, if they have any questions. So again, this is more policy related, but um, we do need you to be able to track that. And again, we define the report requirements on this next slide, really the number of post-op visit calls to parents of children um, with new ADHD medications. And I think Dr. Manjanoff 
Um, uh, you can describe how they might capture a call versus a uh, in the EHR that some success you've had in your past. And most most EHR should, systems should have a mechanism to track telephone encounters or telephone calls. So they would just report as you know, what um, you know, they had say 20 children were given new prescription during that period, or 200 depending on the practice size of them. Maybe 150 parents either got a call or attempted to call them. You just need some evidence to show that there was an act, you know, activity on the part of practice to make an outreach to our parents to make sure that they had prescription so. Okay. Maybe we could pause for five minutes for people to ask any questions okay. they have, so we'll just put okay. up a mute yep. and we'll look at the chat box. Because we're giving a lot of information yeah. and they could be confusing. We want to just give you some time to type in questions. Any, any questions so far? Okay, it uh, doesn't look like we have any questions right now, so we're going to continue on. Um, the next metric we're going to discuss really pertains mostly to hospitals. Um, again, this aligns with the uh, requirement for referrals to eligible patients to help home. Um, again, this is about adopting a, a protocol that would include follow-up for patients after um, hospitalization for mental illness. Again, this is creating a quarterly report on the number of patients that were discharged after hospitalization for mental illness and that the number of those patients that were referred to health home. We go to the next slide. Again, for the denominator um, on this one, we really want you to align the uh, denominator with the quarter of patients you're reporting. We put a very generic description there, but we will update. Um, Actually, I think we already have updated this. So the numerator will be the number of patients in the denominator that were referred to a health home uh, agency. And then the denominator is the number of patients six years or older during that same time period that were um, discharged after hospitalization for mental illness. Well, uh, there's, there's one minor correction we'll make in the final set of slides. This is a high performance measure. And, and in fact, in the parenthesis, we, it's also measure that has additional high performance dollars for us. So there's quite a bit of dollars linked to this one metric and that's why it's a standalone metric. We are very close to our target for this year, but we're not there yet. And there's been a significant improvement based on more real time data that we see from state on uh, map dash for our um, process, at least our partners are uh, improving their processes to get more patients in for follow up after discharge. But we're not there yet, and that's one of the reasons why we're you know, really um, looking for a quarterly report. 
as well as we have specific activities that you know, we're built in as part of incentive plan for this um, project. Yeah, so the important part of this will be able to capture that referral to the health home. So again, we this may be happening, but we want to make sure you can capture that in your EHR report. And one additional comment, the reason why we're focusing on referral to health home, because once there's a referral to health home, in fact, most patients, and for all of the patients, who fall in this category will likely be eligible for health home. We do have children's health home as well, adult health home. But there's a much better chance the patient will keep the follow-up appointment if the health home care manager is uh, connected with the patient, either at the time of discharge or preferred prior to discharge, then there's a better chance the patient will keep the appointment. Okay. And next we go to another metric related to screening for clinical depression and follow-up. And really, this is more along uh, showing improvement um, with our screening. So it's an initiative for depression screening and follow-up uh, using the PDSA framework and to demonstrate a 10% improvement from baseline. So as Dr. Majinoff mentioned earlier, we have not been performing well on this, and really the goal is to initiate a standardized process. Every patient is being screened. Um, and again, um, Dr. Munch, do you want to speak uh, specifically to this? Uh, the only ad additional comment I have, you know, 10 percent improvement from baseline. I think that's the reason why we asked for baseline. But if a couple of our practices are already there at a goal of 80 percent, uh, kudos to them. We want them to maintain that rate to be able to earn incentive for this metric. Okay. And then this next slide just further defines the numerator and denominator. Again, this applies to patients 13 years and older seen during the measurement period. And just to be clear, the 10% is 10% of the gap from your baseline to the goal, not 10% of your current baseline. Correct. Okay, the next one is another standalone metric related to alcohol and other de drug dependence treatment. And again, it's developing a process to track patients that were referred to a substance um, treatment program. The process must include reaching out to patients to schedule appointments and for appointment reminders. Um, the supporting documentation for this is um, the total number of patients, go to the next slide, um, number of uh, referred patients receiving an appointment for initial assessment and number of those patients that received an appointment reminder. Again, this is to improve compliance with follow-up. And Dr. Smith, do you want to just want to highlight, you'll notice the partner type in the top right corner. This is, this is specifically for substance uh, use disorder providers. So this is for the folks receiving the referrals um, that you can uh, track and reach out to the patients uh, who have been referred to you for treatment. Thank you for the clarification. Okay, again, uh, we have one, another uh, metric related to follow-up. Uh, after hospitalization for mental illness. Again, this is developing um, protocols that are put in place to identify and um, provide outreach to patients that were hospitalized for mental illness, schedule initial appointments after discharge, and reach out to patients that are missing follow-up appointments. Um, again, to support this, it will be providing the total number of patients that receive both outreach for initial appointment after hospitalization for mental illness. Um, Dr. Smith, do you have anything to add to this? Just to, uh, this is applied for P, uh, primary care practices that will be outpatient. So with the previous measure re related to hospitals, now we're asking the outpatient providers, if they were to hear about you know, uh, a discharge, we want them to take some proactive steps in making sure the patient gets the follow up appointment with the behavioral health providers. And again, this one is uh, surrounding uh, clinical depression screening and follow up, developing protocols uh, to accept referrals from primary care providers and schedule appointments within 30 days. Again, this provides uh, pertains to the partner type of mental health outpatient providers um, and demonstrate that at least 20% of patients that have been referred have received an appointment within 30 days of the referral. So um, again, this is making sure that those patients who do need some extra help from our mental health providers are being able to be seen within 30 days. Okay, we're gonna go to the next one. Uh, 
the next one is about uh, tracking patients who are prescribed antidepressant medication and outreach to those who are overdue for prescription refills to ensure medication adherence. So um, again, these are creating gap lists and looking at those patients who are prescribed uh, medications and um, have not re either refilled them in a timely manner and providing outreach to them. Next slide. Again, um, so the uh, report will show a registry of patients that received the prescription between April 1st of 2017 and September 30th of 2017. Um, and the number of patients receiving outreach contact for a follow-up visit or medication adherence monitoring. And that will, this pertains to those patients 18 years and older who are diagnosed with depression and treated with an antidepressant medication. Anything additional? Um, just to, you know, I'd like to use this time to just let you know, based on the report, uh, our performance through 2000, June of 2016, I think we met about five or six of the 13 behavioral health measures, pay for performance measures. Um, many of them were for pay for reporting, so I think we'll still get some incentive. But just to let you know that we still have a lot of work to do to try and improve as our incentives will depend more and more on pay for performance pool. Um, we want to try to see how best we can improve our performance on the remaining measures while maintaining the ones that, that we're doing well. So for, for most of these, what we're asking for really is, as we stated at the last meeting, a published health approach, creating cohorts of patients who meet the denominator and then track them using a registry approach and identify patients who are due for certain things and, and as well as, as you get new patients added to the registry so that you have a pool of population focus that you track over a period of time and manage them as a whole rather than looking at more individual patient approach. I just wanted to highlight quickly something important in the cohort column, the second column down in the bottom table. Uh, number of people age 18 and older diagnosed with depression and treated with an antidepressant medication. We don't specify with depression uh, in the column above it. That's important because, uh, you know, folks can be prescribed antidepressants for any number of conditions. We are focused on the patients with depression uh, who are prescribed an antidepressant medication, not, you know, folks who are prescribed antidepressants for other reasons. So we may need to Sure. highlight that in the report aspect. Yep. Okay. okay, and the next one is again related to an adherence to antipsychotic medications for patients with schizophrenia. Again, as Dr. Majinoff mentioned, our goal is to decrease emergency room visits. You'll see a lot of these are developing gap lists, making sure that patients are filling prescriptions, adhering to their medications. So this is another one related to really taking a look at your cohort of patients who um, have schizophrenia that are prescribed medication and um, are overdue for their prescriptions. So go to the next slide. And we look at the cohort is the number of patients between 19 and 64 with, with the diagnosis of schizophrenia described as antipsychotic medication. And uh, the report will be number one, a registry of all those patients who received the prescription between April 1st of 2017 and September 30th of 2017, and then showing the number of patients receiving outreach for follow-up visit or medication adherence. Next. Um, the next one also relates to clinical depression and um, follow-up, and again, this is adopting a depression screening tool for people over the 12 years of age, approved by Benny, which is the PHQ-2 and 9, um, and developing really protocols that ensure that everyone is being screened and that everyone is receiving follow-up if they're testing positive. And this, the was, one. Yep, and this was uh, due in 331, 2017. Okay, the next one is um, behavioral health outcome measure. It's a standalone metric and it's um, adopt a standardized development and autism screening tool for children approved by Benny and it's the M chat. Yeah, it's also a phase one metric. And it's also a phase one metric that you have uh, submitted as of 410, so we won't spend time discussing this. Okay. 
the next one, again, is to uh, really build some clinical decision support into your EHR that can flag patients that have not been screened for clinical depression um, within the last year and make sure that those patients, when they come in for their next visit, are screened appropriately. So to support this, we'll have five de-identified screenshots of alerts in your EMR for patients that have not been screened for clinical depression using a standardized depression tool within the last year. So again, this is developing a gap list and, and ensuring that we um, are indeed screening our patients annually. And um, again, the numerator for this is the number of people screened for clinical depression, the denominator um, with a qualifying outpatient visit who are 18 years of age or older. We'll, we'll, we'll need to make some changes. We'll, go, we'll clarify it. We'll be looking for screenshots. So um, in the next set of slides, we're going to be moving into our 3AI project. And there are three models for this project. There's um, the way the slides are going to flow is we're going to look at model one first, then um, model three, and then finally model two. Again, these are very particular to primary care practices or behavioral health practices with co-located services. And um, Dr. Manjanoff and Dr. Smith will help with these. Um, and many of you already know which of these you are participating in. So some of these may pertain to others. And, um, and as we get down to um, model two, I think there may be only one or two of you that are participating in this specific model. So Dr. Smith, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, this is the patient engagement um, data that you, most of you who are doing this should be familiar with. Um, for model one, it's clinical depression screenings um, for patients age 13 years and older, um, developmental autism uh, approved screenings for uh, patients 12 years or younger at the appropriate uh, age. Uh, I don't have anything else. No, yeah. we'll, we'll just continue the same template, same process. Yeah. Yep. The only difference is now it's bundled, it's not our standard any longer. Okay, the next one is uh, really to demonstrate that um, we are integrating the behavioral health and primary care records. So really that a primary care provider can actually see what the behavioral health provider has documented and vice versa. So we have asked for screenshots of the identified medical records and behavioral health records that meet the minimum requirements. Uh, provided by Benny. Again, this will be further articulated in the Behavioral Health Roadmap. And for some of you on the phone, you have already provided us with some of these screenshots because they, some of this was due to the state for our Project 3AI for this last quarter. So thank you for those of you who have already submitted this in advance. Uh, next slide. Um, and this is uh, also, we talk about these warm transfers, really um, providing a uh, link or the, that a warm transfer has occurred between a behavioral health provider um, from a primary care practice. So if you're referring within your um, practice to a behavioral health provider, really documenting that that referral and that warm transfer has occurred. Uh, Dr. Smith, anything? No, else? just only to highlight how important this is. I mean, we, we know that as external referrals are made, um, follow-up rates go down dramatically. Um, so if you can introduce your patients who screen positive to either the provider who will be seeing them or the care manager who will connect them with that provider, we think that's going to have a dramatic clinical impact. Okay. And the next one is specific to those who are using the impact model. I believe that Saratoga Hospital is and doing Columbia that and Columbia Memorial. So again, these have very specific requirements um, associated with them. Um, We're going to need to update the, uh, the content in the performance activity as it doesn't exactly reflect the current uh, language. So we're going to update that and, and reach back out. Yep. Okay. And the next one is, again, this is um, uh, adopting the University of Washington Registry. 
to track patients that are receiving care from providers who adopted the impact model. Again, this is registry report that's due on 630, and Dr. Uh, Smith will be providing additional information, but I think those of you who already adopted this model are very familiar with the requirements. And one of them is already providing information, and we want to thank them for the help in helping us meet the milestone. Even though it was due in June, they were kind enough to provide us data before March 31st, so we were able to meet the milestone requirement. Thank you. Thank you, Saratoga. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next slide. Okay, and then again, this is really showing, once again, for the impact model that we have an integrated uh, electronic health record that will show that both providers can see the information that is documented on the patient. That's really important for consistency and care, and um, I think we probably already received screenshots from yep. Saratoga. Thank you again. <laughs> um, next slide. Okay, so then we move on to model two. This is co-locating primary care in a behavioral health model. So it's kind of the opposite of what we were discussing earlier. We have uh, a few providers. One provider possibly. One provider possibly who is going to be adopting this model. And again, it's embedding that primary care provider in a behavioral health practice. So again, showing that um, preventative care screenings, and we will be providing these in the behavioral health roadmap, are being completed on patients that are interacting in this model. And those, again, are aligned with um, <coughs> practice CDC guidelines. CDC yes. guidelines. <laughs> and we will be updating that in the behavioral health roadmap. Correct. And again, this is, is also talked about how important that integration of the electronic health record is, again, in the behavioral health record, that the care being provided by the primary care provider is accessible to the behavioral health provider and vice versa. Um, the next is, again, providing warm transfers in the mental health or behavioral health setting to primary care providers for patients that do screen positive for any of those uh, clinical screenings that, that occur, and that are, those patients are then um, aligned with the appropriate care. Um, next is to develop protocols to ensure that all patients that receive preventative care screenings Utilize the appropriate tools and applicable codes identified by Benny, demonstrate that the screenings have been documented, and to uh, train staff on appropriate documentation in the EHR. Again, ensure patient, uh, we want to ensure that the patients are receiving the screenings, and then more importantly, they're documented in the EHR. Uh, let's just go back to that one again. And there is a training component associated with this one. I just wanted to point that out. Um, so um, again, Let's go to the next slide. We've, meet, we've reached the end of our presentation. We're going to pause for five minutes again to uh, allow people to uh, submit questions. We realize this is overwhelming. It's a lot of information really quickly, um, and we do want to make sure that we make ourselves available to any questions that you may have as you digest this in the next couple of days. Um, uh, so we're going to pause.
Okay, it looks like we don't have any more <laughs> questions. I think you're all overwhelmed. Um, again, please uh, click on the link on the previous slide to submit your attendance for this meeting. And if you, at any time you have any questions, please email disrep at mail.amc.edu. We ask you do this um, so that we can triage the questions appropriately. We realize that there could be a wide variety of contract-related questions, so um, not specifically IP. Um, and another reminder is that the May EHR subcommittee, as well as uh, the various behavioral health subcommittees and project subcommittees, will be reviewing all of these metrics as we move forward. So that'll be another opportunity to really take a deeper dive into these um, associated metrics. Our goal was to really just uh, provide an overview of all the contract-related deliverables that had an IT or EHR component in them. And uh, just as a reminder, we will be sending out a recording, an updated slide deck, and a spreadsheet of all the uh, contract activities. And we've color-coded that, so if it's report-related or if it's just a pure EHR bill or a combination of both, we've uh, assigned a specific color to that. And it will be an Excel spreadsheet form so that you can sort it as you need to for your work stream. Anything else? Yeah. We thank you all for your patience today. I know it was a lot to cover. And please reach out with any questions, and we'll give you a half hour plus back in your day. <laughs>